Now, before Apocalypse chapter 10 becomes a reality. Quite often we hear the phrase, the march of the rainbow angel. But as chapter 10 describes this one, you will notice he is standing. And he is standing, as we have seen before, with his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. So the march has completed by the time chapter 10 and verse 2 becomes a reality in the earth. It's a state of conquest. It's a state when all the world is under the dominion of the Lord Jesus, as we've used the phrase so often. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And so the march has preceded the reality of chapter 10 and verse 2. Now although the phrase is used, the march, and it generally, unfortunately, is misinterpreted as simply being the movement of Christ and the saints until he takes Jerusalem. That, unfortunately, is not the march of the rainbowed angel. The march of the rainbowed angel commences when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth and doesn't finish until chapter 10 and verse 2 becomes reality when the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and the millennium starts in all its glory and all its fullness. The march of the rainbow angel is from the return of the Lord until the kingdom of God is established upon this earth. Now, I know we've said it before, brothers and sisters, but to make sure it's clear in our mind, we've got to make sure we don't make the mistake of some Christadelphians who assume the kingdom of God is going to commence immediately that Jesus Christ returns to this earth. That is not a fact. The kingdom of God, the millennial age, will not commence until the march of the rainbow angel has taken place, until the events which we are briefly going to outline, which are summarized on that chart, have taken place, and when the right foot is upon the sea and the left foot upon the earth, and there is universal dominion in the hands of Messiah. Now, again, just to set the scene for tonight, let us go to the 20th chapter of the Apocalypse, and let us remind ourselves once again of the symbol which is used in chapter 20 when we are given the thousand year period. Now you probably know that the only time that the duration of the kingdom of God is given to us is in the 20th chapter of the Apocalypse. And you'll notice it begins in verse 1 when John says, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain was in his hand. And he lay hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed for a little season. So the first part of chapter 20 is the binding of that old serpent, the devil and Satan, King Sin, as he is personified here in verse 2. Sin is restrained for a thousand years, not totally destroyed. But sin is going to be restrained in the earth for a period of a thousand years. Now that is linked in verse 4 with John seeing thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had he received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And the two are linked together. The binding of sin, 
the restraining of sin power for a thousand years is linked with the promise and the uh, reward of the saints that they live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. You can't have the one commencing without the other. The two start together and conclude together as far as the vision of chapter 20 is concerned. The millennial age has commenced with sin being restrained and with the saints reigning with Christ for that period of the millennium. Now, if you come back to the prophets, to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 65, the 65th chapter of Isaiah is a beautiful paraphrase of what the kingdom of God, when it commences, is going to be like. And you'll notice the prophet links the restraining of sin with the establishment of the kingdom. Isaiah 65 and verse 17. For behold, he says, I create new heavens and a new earth. And I'm sure there's nobody in this room who misunderstands what Isaiah is talking about. It's not a new creation in the sense of what happened in Genesis chapter 1. It's talking about the political situation. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And therefore, it's a new heaven and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another is eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall in long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labour in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of Yahweh, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call I will answer, and while they are yet speaking I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. A glorious picture indeed, something which we should be constantly reading and reminding ourselves of the joy that is set before us. But you'll notice how the prophet links what we have seen in the 20th chapter of the Apocalypse. The restraining of sin. There shall no more be thence an infant of days, verse 20. For an old man that hath not fulfilled his days, the child shall die an hundred years old. And again, in verse 22, as the days of a tree are the days of my people. And what seems to be implied in those verses is Eden restored. The principle of the God in of Eden be declared very good and of course soon after Eden when we are given the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 men lived and women a considerable long time upon the earth Methuselah had been the oldest in 969 but we've got great ages which are indicated in the early chapters of Genesis and it would seem that as the days of a tree will be the days of my people again there seems to be an indication of the returning of long life to the people of the earth. We're not talking about the, the saints. We're not talking about those immortal, because of course they will live forever. We're talking about the mortal population. And therefore the restraining of sin and the establishment of the kingdom of God are linked together. Now that is not going to take place immediately the master set foot upon this earth on his return from heaven. There is going to be a considerable amount of work to do and a considerable amount of time to be taken in doing that work before Isaiah 65, before Revelation 20, before the kingdom of God commences. So when we are talking about the thousand year reign, the kingdom of God, the millennium, we are talking from the time when the earth is at rest, 
when Christ is in control, when all the knees of this world have bowed to him, when the temple has been erected upon the Mount Zion and the people of the earth are going up to worship. That's the glorious picture which is presented in Apocalypse chapter 10 and verse 2. And the march of the rainbowed angel accomplishes that work. Chapter 10 verse 2 finds it at rest. The work has been done. We briefly, God willing, want to look at the outline of that work. Now, I'm sure you've all seen this map before. I was going to get a better one done, but my artist was on holiday last week, so I couldn't arrange it. That's my mother-in-law. Uh, so I have to get this sort of copied. By no means deadly accurate, and certainly not in any order. But it does give you some indication of the work which is yet to be accomplished. Now, if we could just run down the things which are set before us upon the chart. The first and foremost is, of course, the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. That is obviously the first thing that's got to happen. And then we'll just quickly run through these. The resurrection of the dead, the judgment seat, and the rewards and the rejection. So the first work to be accomplished by the Master on his return is the resurrection and the judgment of those who are responsible to him. Then it deals with the effect upon the earth of the great confederacy from the north. So we've got the Russian overthrow of Turkey, we've got Europe confederated by Gog, that Russia comes down into Egypt, there's a worldwide time of trouble, and Russia besieges Jerusalem. So that basically is giving us the background as against Ezekiel 38, Daniel 11, Zechariah 14, and other such references. Then the next section is dealing with the perfect multitudinous Christ. Now this is after the judgment is over, when the saints who are acceptable are um, immortalized and then comes the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now the marriage supper of the Lamb, again contrary to some opinion, does not take place, does not take place when the millennium is established. It's quite clear, and we shall see it, that the marriage supper takes place before the Lord Jesus Christ with his saints go forward to war and therefore it is generally accepted when we look at it in this context that the marriage supper of the Lamb will take place immediately after the um, immortalization of those who are acceptable to him. Those will then comprise the cherubim, Yahweh Sabaoth. And their work, first of all, will be the Arabs coming in subjection to him as they now go forward as the, as the cherubim, as the multitude and as Christ's body to bring the world into subjection. The Western powers, those who go to the defense of Israel, are humiliated. And then we've got the smiting and healing of Egypt. We've got the Russian triumphant, or as it would seem, as the image stands erect. We've got Armageddon, the Valley of Judgment, and Christ being revealed for the first time, as far as the worldwide audience is concerned, as the Mount of Olives splits. The kingdom established in Zion. Now please, don't misunderstand the phrase. I said it was imperfect, it's not the kingdom. The kingdom is not established in Zion in the sense that it's God's kingdom upon the earth. What happens is that after the Mount of Olives split, Christ enters Jerusalem and establishes himself as king, but by no means is the kingdom at that time subdued under him. The great changes in the Middle East. Then there's the gospel proclamation to the world to fear God and give glory to him, Apocalypse 14. We've got the nations of the world basically rejecting the offer. Then we've got the wars 
which will lead to their subjection. And then, completely out of context, but running on as far as these numbers are concerned, we've got the work of Elijah as he brings Israel back from the dispersion to the land, the worldwide second exodus of Israel. They have to be established under the bonds of the covenant. Then, because of the wars, because of the judgments which God, through the Lord Jesus, has poured out upon this earth, the nations are subject to him, the house of prayer for all nations has been built, the universal rule is now accomplished, and the millennium begins, and the glory of God is revealed. So, even though that by no means covers all the aspects, at least it gives you some indication of the amount of work which has got to be accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints before the kingdom of God is established. Now, if you can refer to the other chart, or the other series of notes which you've done, this was compiled um, for, believe it or not, a young people's class which we did um, a few years ago, whereby we summarised the events of the return of Christ and gave, with the help of others, some of the references which are applicable to the various headings. Now again, because of time, we're not going to go through every quotation and every section which is mentioned here. Again, if you want to at your leisure, they're there for you to consider. What, again, I want to stress, and the reason for bringing these along, is here on three pages with, you know, a great number of quotations which bring the scriptures together is an indication of the work which has got to be done before the kingdom of God is established. There are many, many references throughout the scriptures which give us the work which Christ and the saints must accomplish before the kingdom of God is established. Before the rainbowed angel, he's standing still in the position that he occupies in chapter 10 and verse 2. Now, because I'm sure we're all very familiar with the actual return of Christ and the judgment seat, and particularly as that's going to appear for us in the Apocalypse, in chapter 15, if you would like to have a look, sorry, it, it comes in, um, in chapter 11, first of all, chapter 11, you remember under the seventh trumpet, verse 15, the seventh, and seventh angel sounded and there were given voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world, etc. Then you'll notice in verse 18, the nations were angry, thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and thou shouldest give it reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. When we come to the, this section in our study of the Apocalypse, I propose, God willing, to have a look in depth at the resurrection and the judgment as it applies to each one of us, and try again to extract from the scriptures all the relevant passages which have a bearing upon resurrection and judgment and the responsibility of those who are responsible to it. And therefore I propose to leave the section dealing with resurrection and judgment until we come to chapter 11 and verse 18. And therefore, if we look at these summary of events which we've listed down for you, apart from those things which have to do with the saints, the next work which we have suggested is Elijah's work of restoration. Now, because... Elijah's work of restoration will not appear in the Apocalypse. I want us to have a look at that for a few moments this evening. Now, you ought to be aware why it won't appear in the Apocalypse. The Apocalypse has never been given to natural Israel. The Apocalypse is for the servants of God. And therefore, there is nothing in the Apocalypse which is related to Israel. There is nothing in the Apocalypse 
which speaks of their restoration to their land and to the establishment of them as a people in that land. It's to the servants of God, to the saints in Christ Jesus, which the Apocalypse has been given. And therefore, whereas most of the other things we're going to look at are covered in the Apocalypse in one way or another, that relating to Israel isn't. So, let's go back to the prophets. And let's go back, first of all, to Malachi chapter 4. We want to therefore briefly, because I'm sure most of it you might already appreciate and therefore we only want to get it fixed in your mind we want to just have a look at some of the work of this great prophet now Malachi 4 and verse 5 is the one which is normally quoted to speak about the future work of Elijah behold I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and the, of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse now some unfortunately have read Malachi 4 verse 5 and have said that Elijah will precede the return of Christ to the earth that has got nothing to do with what Malachi has said that is not true Malachi says he will go before the great and dreadful day of God. Now the great and dreadful day of God, as indicated elsewhere in the scriptures, is the great battle of Armageddon. The battle of the great day of God Almighty. When all nations are gathered to Jerusalem to battle. That's the great and dreadful day, spoken of many times in that way throughout the scriptures. And what Malachi says is that Elijah will go before that day. Now, that day is not the return of Christ to the earth. The first work of Christ to the earth, as we have said, is the resurrection and judgment of the saints. His first work will be to his household. As Peter says, if the judgment first begins at us, where will the sinner and the ungodly appear? And therefore, Elijah will be no different to you and me as far as the judgment seat of Christ is concerned. We are told very clearly by the Apostle Paul that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And whether your name's going to be Abraham, or David, or Elijah, or each one of us, we shall stand before him there will be no exceptions to the rule there will be no one who will have an, um, uh, an automatic passport into the kingdom of God everyone responsible will stand before him now we know that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and these will obviously be in the kingdom of God but the principle remains the same, brethren and sisters. They will stand, because Paul said they would stand. Paul will stand, Peter will stand, all the great men and women will stand in exactly the same position as you and me. Pray God we might have their faith in that day. But the principle remains that they will stand. So Elijah will stand before the judge of all the earth. And therefore he cannot by the simple means of logic he cannot precede the return of Christ to the earth because the judgment seat will not take place until Christ is in the earth and Elijah has got to stand before him and therefore it is impossible for his work to commence until Elijah has been immortalized with the rest of the saints and therefore what Malachi is very clearly telling us is Elijah will go before the great and dreadful day the great battle of the of God Almighty but Elijah will stand with us before the Lord Jesus Christ in judgment but after he's been immortalized and we shall look at that when we look at the 11th chapter Elijah has got a distinct work to do which is separate from the rest of the saint community now I don't believe he will necessarily be alone I believe he will have with him the schools of the prophets as he worked with them in the past but nevertheless, he has got a specific job to do. And his specific job is given to us in verse 6. 
that he is to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers that's the work of Elijah he's got to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and conversely the heart of the children to their fathers now if I was to ask you who are the fathers of Israel you would automatically give me the answer Abraham, Isaac and Jacob do you remember in Deuteronomy when, he was, when Israel were told that he's not done it for your sakes but for the fathers sakes for Abraham's sake, for Isaac's sake, for Jacob's sake were Israel that chosen people unto God and therefore the work of Elijah is to turn or to restore the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers what's the prophet mean? to restore the faith of Israel to the faith of their fathers so that in turn their fathers might accept them as their children now right the way through their history it's been one contrary to that they have never had the faith of their father Abraham they have constantly turned their back upon God disobeyed and walked disorderly but Malachi says that Elijah's work is to restore the faith of Israel to their fathers now you all know the history as far as Elijah the prophet is concerned can we go back to the first of Kings and chapter 18 and to remind you of a Sunday school lesson which you're all familiar with and yet like with David and Goliath and like with many of the other so-called stories of the Old Testament scriptures they are explaining to us very powerful lessons now in 1 Kings chapter 18 we have the picture presented before us of that great contest which was to take place upon the Mount Carmel between Elijah on the one hand and the prophets of Baal upon the other and you remember the terms of the contest that a sacrifice was to be placed upon an altar and whichever there was the God who answered by fire then that was the God to be worshipped and in verse 18 as, the, as Elijah met King Ahab the terms or the, the reason for the contest is explained verse 18 when Elijah says I have not troubled Israel but thou and thy father's house in that you have forsaken the commandments of Yahweh and thou hast followed Balaam now therefore he says in verse 20, 21 how long will you halt between two opinions if Yahweh be God follow him but if Baal then follow him and the people answered him not a word and therefore the contest was set as to which was the true God and which was the God that Israel should worship now I'm not going to bore you with the details you know them well but verse 36 when Elijah comes forward after the um, efforts of Baal of the worshippers of Baal had come to naught Elijah in verse 36 at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice the time when it is normal to pray Elijah the prophet came near and said Yahweh God of Abraham and Isaac and of Israel let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word now listen and notice these words brethren and sisters verse 37 hear me O Yahweh hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and thou hast turned their heart back again thou hast turned their heart back again now that's exactly what Malachi 4 has told us the work of Elijah the prophet will be to turn their hearts back again away from their trusting in the arm of flesh their worshipping the gods of this world as far as the Jewish community is concerned of profit, of position, of power, of materialism far more disastrous to them than even the god Baal and it will be the work of Elijah to turn the hearts of the people back to the ways of God back to the faith of their father now when you think of 1 Kings chapter 18 brothers and sisters 
Elijah's prayer at that time was for the heart of the people to be turned back again. But did it materialise? Was it according to his word? The answer is, sadly, no. Although in verse 39, almost a paraphrase of his word, uh, of his own name, when the people saw that the fire had consumed the sacrifice, they shouted, Yahweh, he is God, Yahweh, he is God. Words were vain. They were easy to utter. But Israel did not, at that point, turn their heart back to God. Israel, at that point, did not follow the ways of Elijah. So much so that when we come to chapter 19, and when he, fleeing from his life before that wicked queen Jezebel, finds himself in Horeb, the mount of God, that Elijah prays that he should die. Because he says in verse 10, chapter 19, verse 10, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The euphoria of Mount Carmel didn't last a few moments. Israel did not turn back. Now, although what Elijah says here was not true, as Paul says in Romans chapter 11, there's always been a remnant. There were the 7,000 even at that time who had not bowed the knee to Baal. Nevertheless, Israel did not respond to the plea of Elijah that they would turn back to worship their God. And then Elijah, by the earthquake, the wind and the fire, had explained to him that his work before the people had been like that, very destructive. He'd been a very good demolition worker. But he would never get the people to respond to God in that way. The fire and brimstone might frighten the people, but they will never educate the people. And therefore, what Elijah was told is that the people had got to be instructed, not by fire and wind and earthquakes, not by destructive methods, but by the still small voice. But he was taken away to allow the effect of the still small voice to have its purpose in the earth at that time. And that still small voice was fulfilled in Elisha as far as the first fulfillment of it was concerned. It was the voice which spoke unto the people. Now, Elijah was taken off the scene when his work was completely unfinished. It was Elisha who was to carry on the work. But the work of restoring Israel back to their God was totally unfinished as far as Elijah was concerned. And therefore, what Malachi is indicating to us is that Elijah's work, when he comes the second time, will be the fulfillment of the work that he began, you know, 18 and, uh, sorry, 2,500 or so years ago. It's a continuation of that work. The principle is exactly the same. For him, to restore Israel back to their God. Now, again, something to get clear. Elijah's work was to Israel, the ten tribes. It was never to Judah, the two tribes. Now, when the master comes, he will go first of all to Judah. He will go to the land and he will save the tents of Judah first. Again, it will not be the work of Elijah to restore Judah. It's the work of Elijah to restore Israel. And Israel, scripturally speaking, are the tribes in the dispersion. The Jews scattered throughout the length and breadth of this world, be they in London, New York, or wherever. It is not the Jews which are in the land of Israel to die as a nation. That's Judah. Not because necessarily they can trace their lineage back and say, yes, I belong to the tribe of Judah. Scripturally speaking, the Jews in the land, when the Lord returns, are classified as Judah. Those who are in dispersion when the Master returns are classified as Israel. It will be the work of Elijah to restore Israel back to the land. 
Judah already in the land will see first the Messiah and he shall save the tents of Judah first when they shall look upon him they have pierced and mourned and they'll ask the question what are these wounds in thy hand and in thy side now Judah have already had a visitation to prepare them for the coming of Messiah not because there is somebody again going to precede the return of Jesus Christ to the earth because the work as far as Judah is concerned has already been accomplished why do we say that and by what authority do we say that remember John the Baptist he came to prepare a people for their Lord and where did John preach John preached at Bethabara and Bethabara was of course in the kingdom of Judah and it was to the Jews those who had returned to the land under Ezra and Nehemiah to whom John was preaching and what does John describe himself as John describes himself as the fulfillment of 1 Kings chapter 19 as far as Judah was concerned what does he say of himself I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness the still small voice was heard through John and the voice spoke unto the people and the voice which spoke said prepare ye the way of the Lord the voice spoke and said repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins the voice spoke and said here is your Messiah accept him hear him they refused the, that voice of John and therefore the master condemned Judah by the words henceforth ye shall see me no more until you say blessed is he that cometh in the name of Yahweh now we're going to see that as we go through the events of Christ's return Judah have had their preparation or bet they rejected it or bet they turned their back upon him who was their Messiah the voice has gone forward to them and therefore it will be to them that the master returns the second time as Joseph appeared unto his brethren the second time the work of Elisha sorry of Elijah as the voice is to go forth to Israel to the tribes scattered abroad and again please don't misunderstand when I say the tribes I am not necessarily saying that the Jews in this country or in America or anywhere else can trace their ancestry back to the ten tribes of the nation of Israel we're not saying that at all we are not quoting Hubert Armstrong in the British Israelitish theory that Britain and America are the last, te last ten tribes of Israel that's utter rubbish what we are saying is that scripturally the Jews in the dispersion at Christ's return are termed under the heading of Israel or Ephraim which of course is a synonymous term and therefore the work of Elijah is to bring Israel back to the land now if you'd like to come with me to uh, the prophet Amos you look at the ninth chapter verse 9 says Amos 9 and verse 9 for lo I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations like as corn is sifted in a sieve yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth so although in fulfillment of all the other prophecies which we know Israel has been scattered to the four corners of the earth sifted among all the nations God was still concerned for them not the least grain would fall upon the earth and it will be the work of Elijah to bring Israel back home or to use the symbology of Amos chapter 9 and verse 9 
to bring the, the corn back into the barn. And that's what he will do. Now, if you'd like to go, while you're in the Minor Prophets, to the prophet Micah, and come to the seventh chapter of Micah, we're given an indication in Micah chapter 7 of how long this work of Elijah is going to take. Micah chapter 7 and verse 14 says, Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine inheritance, which dwell solitarily in the wood, in the midst of Carmel, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old, according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvellous things. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto thee marvellous things. Now, you will notice in verse 14 that the prophet says, Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage, which dwell solitarily in the wood, in the midst of Carmel. And therefore he is speaking concerning his people, the nation of Israel. And he says, according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvellous things. Now, it doesn't need me to tell you that it took them 40 years to come out of Egypt to enter the promised land. And therefore, there is an indication here and elsewhere that again is going to be a 40 year period for Israel to come back to their land to be settled according to their former estates of Ezekiel chapter 48. And the work of Elijah is going to go into every corner of this earth to cause all the nation of Israel to come back home. Now some like the nations are going to reject the offer and therefore they're going to be purged out and destroyed. The kingdom and nation that will not serve thee shall perish. And that's going to be the same principle for Israel. Those who will not come back voluntarily, those who will not serve, will perish by the wayside. And Ezekiel speaks of it as purging out the rebels. But in the context of the whole, and all the details which are concerning Elijah's work of restoration, are listed for you there on the summary of events and therefore if you want to go through all the chapters and all the references they're all there for you but if we stop to ponder each and every one would obviously take many a night just to consider the work of Elijah as, as interesting as it is but the point we want to establish in the overall picture is Elijah will go forth after the work of judgment as far as the saints are concerned after the marriage of the Lamb to which he as a saint will be invited and therefore he will go forth to commence his work of restoration after those things have taken place now again what I'm going to suggest to you at this time and hope to prove by the time we've finished our considerations of these is that the work of Elijah will coincide exactly with the other work which is going to go on simultaneously. So for the 40 years that Elijah is restoring Israel back to their land, 40 years is also going to be accomplished in the other things which have got to be done until the kingdom of God is established. And therefore Elijah would seem to leave the bulk of the same community after the marriage supper has, uh, has taken place to go forth to his people. Now, we'll only take one or two references just to, shall we say, whet your appetite as to what's going to happen as far as Elijah is concerned. Can we go to Jeremiah 3? And I'm only going to spend a couple of uh, minutes on this and then the rest of it you can take up for yourselves in your own leisure um, and perhaps use some of the notes we've put down there as a basis. Now, Jeremiah chapter 3, in verse 17 gives us the picture of Apocalypse chapter 10 and verse 2. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Yahweh and all nations shall be gathered unto it 
to the name of Yahweh to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. At that time, at the time when the kingdom of God is established, at the time when the millennium commences, at the time when the rainbowed angel is at rest with his one foot astride the sea and his other astride the earth, at that time, Jerusalem shall be the throne and all the nations will be going up to worship. Verse 18 says, In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for inheritance unto your fathers. So the two sticks have become one in the hands of the Son of Man. Now, just keep your marker there, and to make sure you understand what I'm saying, come with me to Ezekiel 37. Now, Ezekiel 37, we're all familiar with, is the Valley of Dry Bones, and the coming together of the nation of Israel. And in verse 16, the prophet says, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick, and write upon it for Judah, and for the children of Israel his companion. Then take another stick, and write upon it for Joseph the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel his companions. And join them to one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And therefore, as we go down the chapter, when we read, for example, verse 21, which we quote so often on a Sunday night, that I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, will gather them on every side, bring them into their own land, make them one nation upon the land, upon the mountains of Israel, one king shall be king to them all, the fulfillment of the prophecies which we are seeing. But then, that is what verse 22 goes on to say. And they shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. The two sticks have become one in the hand of the Son of Man. The stick of Ephraim, the ten tribes of Israel, and the stick of Judah, the two tribes, have become one united nation in the earth, Israel. The twelve tribes gathered together. Now again, we have not seen that and will not see that until the Son of Man is in the earth. What we see is the one stick in the land today, the stick of Judah. It will be the stick of Ephraim, the stick of Israel, which Elijah will bring back to the land so that the two can be joined together as the one nation. And that's what verse 18 of Jeremiah 3 is saying. The house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. Don't forget, in the days of these prophets, they were completely separate nations. But then verse 19 says, But how shall I put thee among the children? Malachi chapter 4, Restore the hearts of the children to the fathers, and the fathers to the children, to be true seed of Abraham, they have got to have the faith of Abraham. Remember what the Master said? Don't say to me you are Abraham's seed if you've not got the faith of Abraham. And therefore, how can they be classed as children of Abraham and be given a pleasant land, a goodly heritage among the hosts of the nation? And you'll notice the retort halfway through verse 19. And I said... Thou shalt call me my father, and shall not turn away from me. Jeremiah 3, 19. And I said, and I believe there, God will be speaking through his prophet Elijah. Because what we have got from verse 19 to the end of the chapter is a narrative which takes place between Elijah and Israel as he goes forward to bring them back to the land. He's speaking of the way they can be restored as children in the sight of God. Thou shalt call me my father and shall not turn away from me. As 1 Kings chapter 18, when they had to acknowledge Yahweh as the true and the living God. And Elijah reminds them of the treachery which they have done. Verse 20. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel. And their response, their reaction is seen in verse 21. 
A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications for the children of Israel. For they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten Yahweh their God. That will come as a shock to Israel again, as it came to a shock to them when the Master was here upon the earth. They felt they were the people of the book. When they were told, if you never read in the scriptures, they were shocked, and so they will be again. When they are told, they have forgotten their God. And therefore the plea of Elijah, verse 22. Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. And they say, Behold, we will come unto thee, for thou art Yahweh our God. Now you should, brothers and sisters, link that with 1 Kings chapter 18, because that's exactly what the response of the people was to what happened upon Mount Carmel. <coughs> when the sacrifice was consumed, and the fire licked up not only the sacrifice but the wood and the stones and the dust and even the water and in verse 39 of 1 Kings 18 the people said Yahweh he is God it was not true at that time as far as their response were concerned but that time in verse 22 of Je Jeremiah chapter 3 it will be true they will acknowledge him as their God in truth as the wise man says, the thing that hath been is that which shall be. No new thing under the sun. So truly in vain, says verse 23, salvation was hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in Yahweh our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labour of our fathers from our youth, their flocks, their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame, our confusion covereth. We have sinned. We and our fathers from our youth, even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of Yahweh our God. And he carries on, just in a couple of verses of chapter 4. If thou will return unto me, O Israel, return. And if thou will put away thine abominations, then thou shalt not remove. And thou shalt swear, Yahweh liveth in truth and righteousness and in judgment. And the nation shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. And it's upon this basis of the confession of their sin, the acknowledgement of their guilt, that Israel will restore to the fold and the rest of the prophets give us all the glorious details of how Elijah will bring them back to the land how he will say to the north give up and to the south hold not back until after that 40 year period when they are brought through the wilderness of the nations they will be brought again back to their land now the establishment and the settlement of them in their land we're going to have a look at as we progress through these summaries but if we can, and if we've done nothing else but establish that Elijah's work is taken place at the same time that the other events which we're going to look at are taking place. It's not something which is going to come before Christ returns to the earth. It's going to come after the judgment, after the marriage, as Elijah goes on his mission as the rest of the saints have their work to do. And so... If we conclude this evening, brethren and sisters, oh, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, uh, Isaiah 26. Isaiah chapter 26. In verse 19. Thy dead, I'm leaving out the words in italics, which shouldn't be there, Thy dead shall live. My dead body shall lay arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as a dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, thy people, enter thou into thy chambers. Shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, Yahweh cometh out of his place, to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Now verses 19 and 20 are obvious references to the resurrection and the judgment of the saints. Thy dead shall live. And then in verse 20 we have that communion of the marriage supper which is given for us in greater detail in the rest of the scriptures when the saints are gathered with the master and they were to hide themselves almost as it were for a little moment 
until the indignation be overpassed. And the indignation is the coming down upon the land upon which God's eyes are upon by the northern invasion. And then in verse 21, the time will come when he will go forth out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. And what we want to take up next time, God willing, is the time when he comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ and the saints will come out of their place, out of the place of judgment, out of the marriage supper. They will come from that place exactly at the same time as Elijah will go forth for Israel. And they will come out to punish the inhabitants of the earth. And you'll notice if you go back to the summary of the events of the chart is that the first power which will feel the might of Christ and the saints will be the Arabs, the end of the first page when we have got the Arabs subjected to Christ. And therefore, as he goes out to punish the inhabitants of the earth it's the Arabs who first feel the might of his power. Now, don't forget, if we can come to Daniel 11, Daniel chapter 11 and verse 14. What we have got from Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45 is basically the indignation which has taken place, which has caused him to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the world. So Daniel 11 verse 40 to 44, uh, uh, sorry to 45, is the indignation which has taken place, which has been unseen as far as the saint community is concerned, because they have been down in the place of judgment and with the marriage supper of the Lamb. But this is all taking place simultaneously. It's not as if, you know, one bit finishes and before the other starts. All these things are going on. And what the Master is going to do now is come out of that marriage supper to punish the inhabitants of the world. And so therefore, very briefly, next time, as we have said, we want to just sketch the picture of how he will come out of his place to establish his power in Jerusalem, to extend his rule then to the ends of the earth. But I felt it was important to get into the context of the, of the chapter, the work of Elijah. His work, not recorded in the Apocalypse, but seen in the Prophets, is to Israel as he brings them back to join Judah in the land. All part of the march of the rainbow.